Hello everyone. Thanks for coming to my talk. My, my name is Bilgin Ibrahim. I work for Red Hat as an integration architect. And in my day job, I use uh, primarily Java with projects such as Apache Camel, ActiveMQ, CXF, Cross, Spring Boot to create integration solutions. Mm -hmm. I've put some of my learnings in a book called Camel Design Patterns. These days, we run those projects more and more on top of Kubernetes and OpenShift. And what I want to share today with you is how uh, running these Java projects on top of OpenShift has changed the way I think and design applications. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So le let's get started. Uh, even though the topic, the topic is around Kubernetes and Java, I just want to say that there are other cloud native platforms and most of uh, what we say today applies also to other platforms. Uh, same way it also applies to other languages, not only as Java. The interesting thing is that most of these cloud native platforms nowadays kind of offer similar capabilities for developers. They all work with containers. They have the concept of a deployment unit, which in Kubernetes is a pod. In some other platforms, for example, in Amazon ECS or Apache Mesos is task group, they have the idea of recurring tasks that can be executed by the platform, uh, provide you with service discovery and load balancing capabilities. On Amazon ECS, that's uh, the application load balancer. On Kubernetes, this, that is the service. They have the possibility to do scheduling and label stuff and provide uh, isolation. Okay. Um, if we have to solve a problem or design something in object-oriented programming, uh, uh, what are the tools we have typically? We have abstractions such as object classes, methods, uh, loops, conditionals, uh, and uh, patterns, the most famous one being the Gang of Four patterns. But, but we really think only in th that abstract level. Uh, using Java, we also have additional things such as threads. Maybe we'll use Maven modules to do build time isolation, uh, Jigsaw to do runtime isolation, packages and classes to do encapsulation. And using all that, basically, we end up, we may end up with something like this. This is an example of Spring Cloud, Spring Boot based distributed application where we have a number of microservices. The statistics service, account service, notification service, which uses uh, libraries such as Ribbon to do service discovery, Hystrix to do um, circuit breaking, and other clusters around, like Eureka for service discovery, Config Server, uh, Zool as the gateway. But the point is, having a couple of bare VMs, we build everything on top of it in Java, and we form lots of clusters of Java applications for different purposes. Now, if we go into the Kubernetes world, Kubernetes offers you a new set of uh, abstractions and primitives that you can use to solve your uh, developer challenges. And the primitives we see here, such as containers, pods, uh, cron jobs, configs, map, these are not uh, admin or ops tools. These are actually primitives and abstractions for developers to use and solve the, uh, and create a solution. And uh, uh, patterns and principles which are built around, uh, which being created right now with using these primitives. If we get to put a Java-based service in a Kubernetes world, it would look like this. So you have your Java application um, in a container which, is, which may, may have a, a volume map to it, using uh, whether that's config map or secret, and your container will have port distribution budget for that will control how it scales down. It can have a, a horizontal port auto scaler to scaling it up. It will have a, a service or ingress to control how external um, consumers can access it. It will be controlled by one of these controllers. You see that diamond set, replica set, stateful set. Oh, and those will be created by something high level like a deployment and cron job. The point is this, uh, this model is very different than having a Java application on a VM where you do everything inside the JVM. Here, the Java application is actually fully coupled with Kubernetes. It, in order to do something useful, it has to integrate well with all these Kubernetes primitives and 
Uh, and actually, you can use these Kubernetes primitives to solve your challenges. You don't have to do everything in Java. You can do the service discovery using co Kubernetes services. You can do the config management using a config map rather than a config server inside the JVM. In this table, I have basically put a set of concerns and how we solve them in Java, and also examples how do those map to Kubernetes. Uh, this is more if you're coming from a Java world, you want to see uh, how a concept in Java maps to a Kubernetes world, basically in a distributed world. For example, if the way we encapsulate behavior in the JVM is by implementing them in classes and instantiating objects, packaging in jars, and the jar becomes actually our unit of reuse and sharing around. In the Kubernetes world, uh, the equivalent of that is the container image, where you have um, a container image that's been instantiated as a container, and you share the container around. The deployment unit, typically in Java world, is a set of jars, whether that's a warrior uh, or another jar that contains the jars. In Kubernetes, that's the pod, which is a collection of containers. Uh, to do encapsulation, we have we can use classes, packages, modules in Java. Uh, in the Kubernetes world, that would be the container itself and different namespaces. Now, as for the other runtime behavior, for example, if you have some kind of preconditions, uh, typically in the Java world, you can code those in your constructor by validating arguments and things like that. In the Kubernetes world, you can use something called init container. Init containers are a set of containers that would run when the pod starts up, and these containers can perform tasks such as validating any kind of precondition, wait on a connection, perform some kind of initialization. Uh, uh, about the post initialization tasks, for example, if you're using Spring, you can use an init method to perform an action after your object has been created. In Kubernetes, you can use a post start hook that will be called by Kubernetes once your container has started. Similarly, before uh, for pre-destroy, before your object is uh, garbage collected, you can use in Java the finalize method and hope that it will be called or use some kind of shutdown hooks. In Kubernetes, there's the proposal around defer containers. This will be a set of containers that are executed when your pod is shutting down. Uh, but the difference is with Kubernetes primitives, you perform these actions not inside a single process, but across multiple processes that are spread across multiple machines. So these are kind of the uh, distributed equivalents of, uh, of the primitives. If you want to execute tasks in Java, we have threads uh, through various ways of controlling that. In Kubernetes, we have job, which is another container that will be started uh, to perform a task. Uh, if you want to do something periodic, we have timer in Java. In Kubernetes, you can use a cron job. So the platform will start at a predefined time interval, uh, a port with a container, execute your logic, and shut it down. So you don't have to implement the logic of scheduling inside the Java. You can delegate that to the platform and just implement the business logic in, in, your, in your application. And we have similarly uh, things to do in the background. For example, in Java, we have diamond threads that do the garbage collection, basically control the health of the JVM. In Kubernetes, there is diamond set, which where you can run stuff that runs before anything else on the cluster to do maybe log aggregation, installing the log aggregation agents and things like that. And from configuration management in the Java, we can use environment variables properties. But in Kubernetes, we have a, something called config map, which basically lets you distribute these configurations across multiple processes. Now, if I have to imagine or to show you how that looks like, at least in my head, uh, Kubernetes is like a distributed application runtime, which controls uh, uh, lots of Java applications. Yeah? Some of these applications may be interacting between themselves. Maybe there are two, two containers in one pod, and they talk to each other over local host. Uh, the pod is controlling these containers as well. Uh, containers may be talking to each other over volumes. You may have a cron job uh, in Kubernetes that controls your application starting and stopping, or there might be a job that's controlling. But the point is Kubernetes turns um, 
into a distributed runtime where you can have multiple JVMs uh, doing stuff, and Kubernetes will control the life cycle of all these processes for you. Here I've just collected a few examples, basically uh, some uh, benefits that Kubernetes provides on top of what a JVM would do. And these are just benefits purely focused for developers. Okay, Kubernetes is also used by uh, admins and ops people, but it's, it's a DevOps tool, so developers are also finding um, benefits using it. For example, the first one I find really useful is the fact um, you can create an environment or an isolated pool of resources with one command. That means if you want to do a spike or do, you, or do some test, you can easily in Kubernetes create a namespace with, to deploy your applications, and you will not have any kind of resource clash, name clash with other namespaces. Once you have a namespace, uh, then the second thing is how do you copy your application to that namespace? In the past, we have to, basically once you have your developer, we had to STP to VM, copy it here and there with uh, Kubernetes, that you don't have to do anything. The scheduler would find a node that has enough resources to run your container. So you can completely forget about the placement aspect, which we had to do manually in the past. Once you have placed your war, then the question is, how do you start your application? Again, in the past, we had to copy a war in a maybe application server, check the logs that it has started, maybe check some endpoints and validate that it has started. With Kubernetes deployment, it can control how your application has started, how it should take down the old version, start the new one, and do things like rolling deployments, recreate deployments, even uh, blue-green and candle releases. But the point is, this is also a declarative activity, and you don't have to worry about it any longer. Another point is about application resilience. Typically, this is, at least in the Java world, that is associated with Hystrix. Yeah, if you use microservices and you want to do circuit breaking, some kind of bulkheading, you would use Hystrix, but only by using containers and some kind of container orchestration, you get additional benefits, and basically you get protection from all kind of errors you can see here. For example, if your application has some kind of infinite loops and consume, consumes a lot of CPU shares, uh, the, the Kubernetes and the resources will control that so it doesn't take other applications down. If you have any kind of memory leak, at least the application will be restarted, so it won't die straight away. It can protect you from other things, uh, such as these hooks, fork bombs, and you can do uh, even circuit breaking and bulkheading outside of your JVM. You can put that in a sidecar or use something like a service mesh uh, and have it provided by the platform rather than doing it inside your JVM. And you get additional benefits like auto-scaling, self-healing, etc. Another point is service discovery. We used to do that also in the JVM. You would have some kind of agent in your service that registers it, whether that's a Zookeeper agent, Eureka agent, uh, and then the consumer would look up um, the registry with uh, Kubernetes. Uh, that is happening, but it's happening outside of your process. So when you start your container, it registers itself to the registry, and the consumer can do server-side dis service discovery. But the point is, inside your JVM, you don't have to worry about the service discovery aspects. In addition, here is a, a, a new thing that's becoming popular these days, that's service mesh, which lets you do things like circuit breaking, service discovery, even tracing outside of your application. So you don't have to add a tracing agent in your JVM. You can do it at the platform level as well. And I would say that's the last point that everything we talked about so far, all that can be written down in the YAML file and executed. So in the past, we used to have all the information about how an application is deployed, how it should scale up and down, uh, how many instances there should be. All that was on some kind of document or, or a wiki. Now all this information is written down in the YAML file. It is created by developers together with the application, and it is uh, executed starting from dev environment to test to all environments. So it's an exec executive and declarative application topology. Uh, in this talk, I've just briefly touched on the primitives. So cloud-native primitives like containers and pods. 
But once you have new primitives, there are new principles. Same way we have the solid principles in the object-oriented world that deals with objects and classes. In the cloud-native world, there are design principles uh, around containers. So I'm talking about this uh, tomorrow. There are also design patterns, which is about how you group your uh, containers together in a pod to solve recurring pro issues. Uh, patterns such as sidecar, ambassador, adapter, and lots of practices around it. If you're interested more about these topics, check out, uh, check out this white paper and maybe the book. Thank you.